the Prophet وسلم, said, This was Jibreel who has come to teach you your religion. Hada Jibreel atakum yu'allimukum dinukum. The meaning of that is that this hadith teaches us the religion. That's the whole religion right there. Iman, Islam, Ihsan, and signs of the last day. And I think it's a really interesting way of looking at it. The way that Dr. Chittick and Dr. Murata are looking at it, as these are dimensions, you have in four-dimensional reality, which is what we're in, you have the three dimensions of width, breadth, and depth. And that's what we experience here if, if you're binocular vision. One-eyed people don't have that depth perception, but we have depth perception. And if you add time, which is the fourth dimension, then what this hadith deals with is these four dimensions. The dimension that is the horizontal dimension is Islam. That is the most basic. That's the foundation. The vertical dimension is Iman or faith because that's the focus towards the heavens. So your behavior is Islam. The reason you do the behavior is Iman. And then Ihsan is what gives it depth. It's what gives it depth. It adds that dimension to it. And then it plays out in time. So we're in time creatures. And one of the things we experience about time is signs. The world is signs. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu said, Al-Zaman Yomani. Yomun laka wa yomun alik. All of time is two days, a day for you, a day against you. And he says, Fashkuri la lima kana lak, wasbir ala ma kana alik. Have thankfulness or gratitude towards Allah for what was for you and be patient about what is against you. And so the basic experience of the movement of time is a recognition that there are signs that come into the world that indicate the type or the nature of the age that we're in. And certainly our age is in many ways a very dark age because people are so distant from sacred truths and and also have an arrogance that obviously that this is the best time ever. The next idea here is Dean because he said, يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينُكُمْ He came to teach you your Dean. What does Dean mean? The Arabic word comes from a root word, dana, yadino, means to discipline. It has the meaning of to discipline. It has the meaning of to consider guilty. Idana is when somebody is guilty of something. It has also the idea of a debt, indebtedness. Dain is debt. Medin is somebody who's in debt. Da'in is the one you owe the debt to. It also has the meaning of a rain, a gentle rain that keeps coming back. And the religion at the essence of religion is an idea that this is, it is a rain. It's a life-giving rain to the spirit that keeps coming back. It's something that keeps coming back and is reintroduced into humanity again and again. So the essence of the human experience has been these rains that have come, revelations that have come, heavenly rains that nurture hearts, that bring people back to life, that bring their lives to a spiritual fruition. The idea also of debt, which is also interesting because there's an idea that if somebody loans you money, you feel indebted to them. And the idea here is that God has loaned you your life. It's a loan. And the beauty of a loan is it's not yours, but while you have it, you can do with it what you want. Now, obviously, if somebody loans you money with a stipulation, if you go to the bank and you tell them, I want $100,000 to buy a house, and then you go and score a kilo of cocaine uh, with the money, obviously, you've broken the contract. They wouldn't just give it to you like that. They don't do it like that anymore. But generally, the idea of taking a loan as a trust, there's a reason why that person's giving you a loan. And generally, people want to know what the loan is for. They ask you, what do you need it for? Well, I need it for this or that. The more honorable the reason, the more likely for the loan. So the idea of God giving you a loan 
a, a goodly loan. It's the loan of your life. And then the beauty of it is, on the one hand, it is a loan. On the other hand, he offers the chance to sell this thing that he's given you back to him. And that is an honoring, according to the Quran. It's in Allah Shtaraman and Mu'minin, Allah bought from the believers. So the idea of God buying from you something is meaning that He's putting you there's parity in the relationship. It's not that you're an equal to God, but in this relationship, He's making you an equal. He's making you somebody who's actually gone into a transaction with Him. And the sale is your soul. And that is a high thing. So the idea of giving the soul back to God and he pays you for it. And that's why when that verse was revealed, everybody was happy except Abu Bakr. He began to weep. And the Prophet looked at him and he said, why are you weeping? And he said, how can we sell back to God what already belongs to God? So he understood it at a deeper level than everybody else, which is why he's Abu Bakr. But he understood that this is an honor from God. That's all it is. And so this idea of this debt, that you are morally obliged to pay this debt back, and that's what the deen is. It's the payback. It's what you do as a way of paying back this immense loan of consciousness of a heart that he gave you human consciousness and this is how you pay it back now in the quran the word deen is used a lot allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it to mean religion the deen and the light islam the religion with god is submission he uses it also when he describes the deen of the king of egypt when yusuf alayhi salam in Surah Yusuf, he says, Fi deen al in the religion of the medic, which means the law. So it has the idea of law as well. And then also, when Musa, Fir'aun says to Musa, you know, Daruni aqtul Musa, let me kill Musa. Ni'akhafu. He says, I'm afraid that he's going to, and you bet did that he's going to change your deen. So Fir'aun says he's worried that Musa is going to attempt to change your deen. And then he says, or that he'll sow corruption in the earth. So this is how the deen, lakum deenukum waliyadeen. You have your deen, we have our deen. So there's an idea of different deens. And that has to do with transaction or how you live your life. Now there's an idea that the deen with God is the same. It's always been the same. And that's why deen is different from sharia. Sharia is law. The law changes. So the law of Moses is not the law of Jesus. The law of Jesus is not the law of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Peace be upon all of them. Each one of the prophets has a different law. But their deen is the same. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Prophets are of one father, but their mothers differ. Now, there's two meanings to that. One is that they come from Ibrahim. Abraham is the father of the prophets. But there's also the meaning that their deen is one, but their laws differ. So the deen is tawheed. That is really the father of us all. That We're all united in this idea of the unity of God. And then the sharia, which are the laws, differ. And Allah says, we never sent a messenger before thee, save that we revealed to him, saying, there is no God but I. So worship me. So that that is at the essence of all of these religious traditions. And uh, even according to Dr. Cleary, he says that the Buddha was actually teaching Tawheed as well. One of the things that he says is that the Buddha did not give a word for it because what he said was that his society was so inundated with idolatry. The only way that he could describe reality was without any attributes at all because these people were so immersed in so he described it in a nondescript way of speaking about ultimate reality the source of all things and that's the same you'll find that in Taoism and I mean you'll find these teachings even if they don't have the theistic concept that you find in the western traditions in the eastern tradition you do find this idea of an ultimate underlying reality that is the source of all things. 
And that's why even in the Tao, it says in the beginning there was one. There was the eternal Tao. And then there came two, which is the Aswaj, the creation of pairs, which Allah says we create everything in pairs. And then from the pairs become myriad forms. Because from two comes three. All of these religions are teaching this unity. So he goes then into the three dimensions. And what he says is if you can look at the three dimensions or domains of selfhood, the most external dimension is connected to what appears. So the outward form, the vahir, people do things in the world. And actions can be analyzed and discussed without reference to the people. So you can look at an action and you can actually talk about an action without any reference to the person. And that's the most outward form. So if somebody hits somebody else, we can talk about, I saw a person hit another person today. We don't have to talk about why they hit them. We don't have to talk about who they were. We can talk about a physical act that occurred in the world between two people, one, the subject, and the other, the object. So then you move to the next dimension, which is knowledge. So it has to do with looking at the thing that's happening and understanding something about the thing. So what does it mean when somebody hits another person? You begin to look at understanding the action itself. And then you move into what is the intention behind the action? What is the reason why somebody is doing something? All of these relate to these dimensions of Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. So you have... A dimension of human experience that has to do with knowledge, understanding, and worldview. So that is about faith, is how you view the world. And then, given that you view the world in a certain way, what are the motives? You can have a person who believes in Allah, and they're doing the outward forms of Islam, but they still have riya, which is hidden shirk. It's doing something for the sake of somebody else. And there's two types of riya. One is called riya al-mukhlis, which is where you do something only for other people. And the other is called riya al-mushrik. And the first one is worse than the second. The, the second one is where you do it for God, but you also are thinking about what other people are thinking. So you can have faith in God, but your motives are still problematic. And we all know in ourselves and we know other people do actions in the world, and then you find out there was an ulterior motive behind it. So what you're looking at here then is these three dimensions. You can have an understanding of how we should behave, which has to do with iman and Islam. How we should outwardly is the actual thing, what I should do. I should pray five times a day. We should understand why we should do that, because God commanded me to. There comes the element of faith. But then the actual movement of my own inner heart to doing that action solely for the sake of God is the realm of ihsan. So these are the dimensions that he's talking about and she is talking about. Right action, right understanding, and right reason. It's very interesting because that's part of the Eightfold Noble Path in Buddhism as well, of understanding, right understanding, having a correct understanding of the world, and then right action, and then right reason. I mean, those are all part. Now, he talks about Islamic learning here. And one of the things that I really like what he says, and she, is that the Quran says, وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمًا عَلِيمٌ Over everyone who has knowledge, there's somebody who ultimately has more knowledge. So he mentions, and she mentions the idea of a person in a village from Egypt that goes down to Cairo memorizes the Qur'an and learns a little bit of fiqh, a little bit of hadith. When he goes back to his village, he's like a big alim, you know, and all that, that Mawlana. But it's relative. When his sheikh comes to the village, suddenly he's back to being an insignificant student. He might not have even been that good at the madrasa. But in the eyes of the other people, because knowledge has that relative aspect to it, that some people have immense amounts of knowledge, some people have less amounts, and some people have a little bit. And at each degree, one is moving up. And that's why Allah raises, elevates people in degrees according to their knowledge and according to their right actions. Allah 
Allah raises people who believe and were given knowledge in degrees. So that is very important, which is why Muslims traditionally have always respected teachers. And he mentions there were no degrees offered. I like what he said and she said about ijazah, the permission to teach. And they really felt that degrees and things like that would corrupt the intentions. And that's one of the things that Sheikh Muhammad Ramin, who was one of my teachers in fiqh, said, don't give degrees because it corrupts the intention of students when they come to study. And that's why if you look at universities today, if, if suddenly all the universities said, by the way, we're not giving any degrees anymore, how many people would show up for class? So learning becomes a means to achieve something else. And in Islam, learning is in, first and foremost, it's a command from God to learn. And learning is based not on earning a livelihood. And one of the signs of the end of time is the Prophet ﷺ said that people would study to earn money. It's a sign of the end of time. Because uh, he said, يكون لغير وجه الله. And it's very interesting because what happens, learning in Islam is to learn how to understand correctly, how to act correctly, and how to have the right reasons. So it's about these three dimensions. It's about being an ethical and a spiritual human being, which doesn't obviate the necessity of learning trade and things like that. It's certainly not. But at the essence of real knowledge is an understanding that it's for moral and spiritual reasons, not for livelihood. And so he says there, and she says on page 36, no degrees were offered, so the motivation was learning itself. The, uh, one of the things in, in Al-Azhar in 1882, when they first introduced tests, the great Maliki scholar, Sheikh Muhammad Alish, was completely opposed to it. The idea of testing students was anathema to him. And I find that really interesting. Because again, it creates another reason why people study. Uh, to pass the test. Not to know the thing. And that's why people can't ever remember anything after tests. Now, one of the things also that's mentioned is that memorization, the importance of memorization, the reason memorization was so important is because the idea of young people understanding anything was really, it was seen as a waste of the other quality that children have, which is the massive ability to absorb information. And so the idea was to put as much of knowledge in them in those early years because it's a divine gift that shouldn't be wasted by teaching them trivia. And so much of what is put into the heads of children is a complete waste of time. And that's why SAT tests are ultimately testing vocabulary acquisition, comprehension, analogical reasoning skills, and mathematical skills, arithmetic, geometry, and basic algebra. I mean, they want to see if you learned how to basically think. They're not interested in asking you how high is Mount Everest or what happened in 1066 because you can always look that up in a book. And Einstein said, anything I can look up in a book, I wouldn't waste my time memorizing, which is interesting. But you need skills to reason. I mean, he certainly had all those formulas in his head.